In 2020, we find France, Belgium, and our own homeland of Australia in the grips of a pandemic. COVID-19 rages the world as war did in 1916-1918. A tour was planned by Battlefield History Tours to take our countrymen to the places where their ancestors struggled and in many cases paid the ultimate price on the other side of the world. This tour, as with many others, was cancelled. This virtual tour cannot replace the experience of actually visiting the sites, standing where our predecessors fought, paying tribute to their valour and sacrifice. However, in a lockdown, where leaving our houses is discouraged and antipodal travel impossible, it is the best that we can do. G'day. So usually at this time of the year, I've been in France and Belgium leading a group of Australians on a pilgrimage to the places where their ancestors fought and in many cases paid the ultimate price between 1916 and 1918 on the far side of the world. This year such a tour is not possible. So from the confines of my self-isolation all I can do is put together this virtual attempt to follow the tour that would have been. We head north from Paris. At our first stop, we jump to the end of hostilities, the glade of the armistice. The monument takes your breath away. Marshal Foch stands sentinel over the site. Hitler had the site cleared in 1940 so that all Fox granite eyes would see is a wasteland. The dark days of 1940 saw the rail carriage in which the armistice of 1918 was signed dragged from its protected location and used again to sign an armistice, this time one to avenge the reparation years as the world once again plunged itself into destructive conflict. Since 1946 all has been restored. A representation of the original carriage stands in a memorial that traces the history of the two signings. As we leave the site, another pause, this time at the memorial to Alsace and Lorraine, the two provinces in German hands from 1871 to 1918. After more time on the freeway heading north, we stop at the Canadian Memorial at Vimy. The memorial masks were from the 9th to the 12th of April 1917. The four divisions of the Canadian Corps drove three divisions of the German 6th Army from the dominating feature. The Vimy Memorial has a fine resource centre. and we get to tour the tunnel system under the guidance of a Canadian student. The Canadians have also constructed a concrete sandbag replica of the trench system the soldiers attacked from. After a night spent in Ypres, we head to Messiaen, site where from the 7th to the 14th of June 1917, Monash's 3rd Division first saw combat. 
The action was under the overall command of General Plumer. It was a success, a chance for the Australians to learn from one of the British Army's few masterful leaders. Messiaen was also where the Christmas truce occurred. We get a chance to visit the monument to the soldiers who, for a short time, got to see beyond the belligerence of their governments in Christmas 1914. Hill 60 is nearby. We get to see the bunker that dates from the conflict. We get to contemplate the loss of the tunnellers who mine below where we are standing. Hiding beyond the railway cutting whose spoil was used to create the hill, we find the remains of a mine crater. Jump forward to April 1918. We visit where the ha Battle of Hazebrook was fought by the 1st Australian Division. One div was by this time the only Australian formation not to have joined the rest of the Australians gathering before Amiens and soon to be under a native-born commander. The German 1918 offensive was in full swing on two fronts. To, in the south, our troops were to block Operation Michael as it sought to split the front and take the rail, the rail centre at Amiens. Here, Operation George, aiming to force the British forces back to the channel ports and out of the war, had begun to open a crack in the line. Two Portuguese divisions had crumbled. The Germans were approaching the supply centre of Hazebrook. One div was moved to block the advance. They had just deployed when the Germans approached. Corporal Turvey of Wagga noted in his diary, We had scarcely got into position and were gazing out when we saw miles of infantry slowly but surely goose-stepping towards us. Officers on grey horses were riding up and down the column. Australians dug in in open formation using fields of fire to cover gaps in their hastily dug yet well camouflaged entrenchments. The Germans attacked with overwhelming force for five days. On the last day, 17th of April, the Germans attacked in force at 10 o'clock and again at 17.30. Both attacks failed, with estimates of over 700 Germans killed in front of the Australian positions during the day. The British and French also shattered the German attacks in nearby Metheren. This was the end of the major German effort to dislodge the Hazebrook defenders. The Australian 1st Division and their British allies had proven unshakable and too costly to the Germans. In the evening, we attend the Menon Gate ceremony. After another night spent in a warm Ypres bed, we head to Polongon Wood, site of the fight by four and five divisions from the 26th of September to the 3rd of October 1917, through the wood taking pillbox after pillbox until, until the mound that had been the butts of a pre-1914 rifle range was taken. The concrete pillboxes. The Zonnebeck Five. The New Zealand Memorial. 
and the butts. Then on to Tyne Cot Cemetery, where we discuss the Battle of Brunsinda, where Australians of one div attacked at the same time as the Germans. The Australians continued to advance, succeeding to roll over and neutralise the German attack. We also discuss Passchendaele, where the Australian 2, 3 and 4 divisions and the New Zealand divisions attacked over boggy ground on the 12th of October 2020. The result was inconclusive. The tired and understrength Australian units failed to take the vital ground, holding their positions until reinforced by the Canadian Corps. Then to Langemark German Cemetery. Our final destination in Flanders is Poperin, where our soldiers were able to rest between battles. Poppering also served a sinister purpose. This post is one of those the British tied their own soldiers to, killing their own for the crime of PTSD. After a pleasant evening in Ypres, we pack our bags and load them on the bus. Our first stop is at the Cobham Memorial near Fermel. There, on the 19th of July 1916, the newly formed Australian 5th Division, three quarters of whom were new to combat, was committed against the Germans. Over 5,500 Australians became casualties. Almost 2,000 of them were killed in action or died of wounds, and some 400 were captured. A survivor of the battle was a young man from Boundary Street, Parramatta. In 1912, at age 15, Stan Chipperfield put his age up and joined the army with his horse at Lancer Barracks, Parramatta. At the same time, Stan obtained a position as a shop assistant with Mr Harry Quigley, a mercer, being a dealer in textile fabrics, especially silks, velvets and other fine materials of Parramatta. This is Stan in his Lancer uniform. Stan, you'll note that he's wearing a black cox plume, not an emu plume. And quite importantly, you'll note that he is a qualified signaller, proficient in semaphore, morse code and telephone cable lane. In August 1914, many of his colleagues in the New South Wales Lancers resigned to join the 1st Light Horse Regiment AIF. Stan didn't. He joined the AIF on the 2nd of October 1915, going as a re reinforcement to the 12th Light Horse AIF, another New South Wales Light Horse Unit. By the time he arrived in Egypt, the Gallipoli campaign had concluded. There was some concern about future employment of the horsemen, and the young Light Horseman's signal training was needed by the artillery. He was initially demoted from trooper to gunner, then on the 21st of April 1916 promoted to bombardier with the 25th Field Artillery Brigade. Stan was in charge of a small group of soldiers responsible for the establishing and maintaining of telephone communications between gun positions and observers based forward with the infantry 
an essential element by which artillery could be protected from direct observation and targeting by the enemy. Stan's section found themselves in action at Frommel on the 19th of July 1916. Stan's citation for the DCM awarded for his work on that day states the decoration was for conspicuous gallantry during the operations as a telephone specialist. He worked incessantly under very heavy shell fire, maintaining communications between the trenches and the battery. He was buried by the explosion of a shell, but on being rescued, it was at once, at once restored communications and maintained them until relieved. Soon after, in the same battle, he received a gunshot wound to the chest. He was sent to Newcastle in England to recuperate and was doing well. That is, until he caught pneumonia. Stan died on the 8th of August 1916. Stan's dad John and his mum Alice would have received Stan's medals in the mail. They didn't get their boy back. Next we visit VC Corner, a nickname soldiers gave to the area during the war, referring either to the bravery of the Australian troops or the danger of the place that demanded bravery to be held. The cemetery contains 410 unidentified bodies retrieved from the battlefield after the armistice. That is more than two years after the battle. There are no headstones in the cemetery. Two large concrete crosses laid face down on the grass mark where the soldiers are buried. The memorial lists almost 1,300 Australian soldiers who were lost in the battle and have no known resting place. then just up the road to the new Pheasant Wood Cemetery. These graves are for those who were killed in battle and buried in a mass grave by the Germans. Since 1910, the bodies have been gradually identified... Sorry, since not 2010. The bodies have been gradually identified by DNA analysis and moved to the cemetery. Thence to Bulacore, site of the first Australian encounter with the Hindenburg Line in April 1917. A story of tragedy, loss and a lack of understanding when it comes to new technology. The museum in the town is a story by itself. It started in a barn and is now in a state-of-the-art facility. We arrive in Peron. And visit the Museum of the Great War. After a first night's kip in Peron, we head to a point just south of Sally la Boiselle, the start line for the Somme Offensive in July 1916. Then to the Lochanaga Crater, blown at H hour on the 1st of July 1917, it is the largest crater left from the Great War. It shows by its sheer size that mining was of limited use when assaulting an entrenched enemy position. Up the road and we enter the village of Poziers and the One Div Memorial. Here from the 23rd of July to the 3rd of September 1916, the 1st, 2nd and 4th Divisions experience their first European conflict. One and two divs 
were vet Gallipoli veterans. Four Div contained the 4th Brigade that had been in Gallipoli from the 25th of August 1915. The fighting was vicious. The 1st Division lost 7,700 men, the 2nd had 8,100 casualties and the 4th lost 7,100 men. This is the remains of a German bunker on the edge of the town. It demonstrates the German tactic of holding major forces underground to attack attack assault waves in rear. We now go on to the windmill feature. And Mokay Farm, the limit of Australian exploitation. At this point the Australians needed to be withdrawn for rest and reinforcement. A short distance away is the Thiepvale Memorial, where 70,000 British soldiers who died on the Somme are commemorated. Nearby again is the Newfoundland Memorial at Beaumont Hamill. In 1916 Newfoundland was not part of Canada. It was a small dominion. The population raised a battalion for the war. They fought at Cape Helles, Gallipoli. They were experienced soldiers when committed here, fighting until dead men can go no further. Further on we reach Fleurs and pay our respects to an Australian grave. An early rise for today's Anzac Day where we would usually hear dignitaries from home pay their respects to those who served and died over a hundred years ago. After the dawn at the Australian National Memorial we walked to the town where we experienced the town service. Villers Bretner was taken back from the Germans on the night of the 24-25 April 1918 by the Australian 13 and 15 Brigades. A restful afternoon follows as we visit Amiens and its Notre Dame Cathedral. Another restful night and we're back to the Australian National Memorial where we discuss the battle on 24-25 April that turned back the German forces. Then we spend the rest of the day in town visiting the Victoria School Museum. An Adelaide cemetery where the unknown soldier once lay. Then on to Dernacor. Where on the 5th of April 1918, Four Div blocked the German thrust toward Amiens against overwhelming odds. Fought along the railway line and the fields beyond, a single brigade up, the 12th, held off desperate attacks by the German 13, 50 and 79 Reserve Division. Our next stop is Sally Le Sec, where Monash commanded his 3rd Division for the last time. 
The division moved down from Wannerton in Flanders where it had been steadily peacefully penetrating the German lines. Here arriving the 26th of March 1918, the division simply had to dig in to deter the German advance. Peaceful penetration followed, exposing a salient to the south around the village of Le Hamel. Just up the road, if you know where to look, we find the site where the Red Baron crashed after being shot down by Australian machine gunner Cedron, Cedric Popkin. Fresh from another pleasant evening in Perron, we visit the Sir John Monash Centre.
that from the very beginning you will establish the whole continent. There is no spot on the whole of the tortured soil of France which is more associated with Australian history and the triumph of Australian soldiers. A short drive takes us to the Chateau Bertangles, Monash's headquarters, and the nearby community cemetery where Manfred von Richthofen was first buried. Thence to the site of the Battle of Le Hamel the proof-of-concept engagement where Monash was able to apply his engineering genius to the battlefield with great success. 93 minutes and the salient created by peaceful penetration to the north disappeared and the all-arms approach whereby technology minimised casualties actually worked. Selective use of gas ensured the Germans wore their cumbersome masks while Australians did not have to. Aircraft masked the noise of tanks being deployed. The new Mark V tank was able to prove its new driver steer mechanism made all the difference. Flares and aircraft meant headquarters knew where every forward unit was. It was no walk in the park. The enemy fought fiercely. Two Victoria Crosses and a Congressional Medal of Honour showed the intensity of the conflict. An advance of only two kilometres, a salient removed, a concept proven. Another uh, pleasant sleep in the town of Peron, where French cuisine is great. Escargot and Cheval on the menu last night. And we set off for the site of the main event, the Battle of Amiens. Our discussion site at Heath Cemetery sits on the objective line. We discuss first of history's lightning war advances, 10 kilometres in the first day on the 8th of August 1918. However, destruction of a supply depot stacked with loaded tanks could not impede this meticulously planned assault. How the reticence of the British Three Corps to the north exposed four div to German artillery that took out four of their support tanks and how this problem was resolved by two sergeants initially on a souvenir run who with six privates from one battalion AIF were able to make the kind of progress the British Corps could not accomplish. A final discussion point was the run by 17 armoured cars that showed the land before Australians was clear of determined enemy. Then the Army Commander Rawlinson stepped in. He chose to restrain the Australian initiative. He advanced the Canadians to the south. 
the Canadians got caught up in ravines, complicated by German forces moving toward the Australian flank. The offensive was stopped on the 11th of August. The Canadian Curry negotiating with Rawlinson to move to Arras, more open ground. Rawlinson's mistake and Curry's reticence meant the war was to go on for another month. At Preuer, we experienced another German cemetery. Many of the Germans who fought in World War I were Jewish, including the one that nominated Hitler for the Iron Cross. At the site of the Battle of the Great Bend of the Somme, Perone and its dominating feature, Mont St. Quentin, was only lightly held when the armoured cars visited on the 9th of August. It was 30 August before the Australian Corps had crossed the river and canal and were facing the mountain. At 0500 on 31st they attacked Mount St Quentin. Brigadier General Martin's fire brigade consisted of 1,320, including 70 officers, a third the normal strength of an Australian brigade. The mountain, or rise in the ground, was held by the 2nd Prussian Guards Division, consisting of the Kaiserin Augusta and Kaiser Alexander regiments, rich in tradition. The fighting was hard. Australians exaggerated their presence by shouting. All of Tudiv was involved in taking the position, and by late on the 3rd of September, the whole of Perone and most of the high ground in the vicinity was in Australian ha hands. The German household division had broken and ran. The Tudiv Memorial atop the mount is the only one of the five that is not a single steely. The original memorial had a depiction that angered the Nazis. It was destroyed in 1940. The memorial was paced, replaced by this more contemplative structure. Massimo German Cemetery. Forward memorial at Bellinglisi, where we discussed the innovative approach Monash used to take the Hindenburg outpost line. Out of tanks, he brigaded the Corps' machine guns to provide an armour of bullets for his troops to advance behind. On to the St Quentin Canal at Riquival. The canal was a brainchild of Louis XIV. The tunnel opened by Napoleon and Josephine in 1804. It was the centrepiece of the Hindenburg Line defences. Now out of fresh Australian troops, Monash was allocated a US Corps to continue the offensive. Brave but impulsive, inexperienced, and with many of their leaders on course, the US soldiers fell into the same German defensive traps Australians had fallen in 1916. Their supporting tanks halted by forgotten British minefields laid to defend against German A7Vs. The day was carried, but only by follow-up Australians taking control and forcing victory. Our final stop is the One Tree Hill Cemetery at Montbrahan. On the 5th of October 1918, the Australians took the heights beyond this village to cover the deployment of the US-2 Corps, who took over the Australian sector. Private Taylor's grave, the most easterly grave of every, any member of the AIF on the Western Front in the First World War. 
By the 10th of November, the Australians were ready for battle again. They were not needed. Sad that we could not tour physically in 2020 due to COVID-19 restrictions. Let us hope that by April 2021, the world will have conquered the pandemic and we can be physically on the battlefields to honour those who served.